Greetings again from Vaisla. My name is Janice Bennett Livingston. I'm the Life Science Marketing Manager here at Vaisla, and today I'm joined by Paul Daniel, our Senior GXP Regulatory Export. So we are going to do another Q&A session. Uh, this morning, Paul's going to answer some questions we received by email from some of our contacts, some of our customers. So let's jump right into questions, okay, Paul? Sounds good. Okay. All right. So question one, what are the acceptance criteria in a mapping study for temperature compliance between monitoring and mapping loggers? He goes on, my mapping sensors have an accuracy of plus or minus 0.5 degrees C, and my monitoring loggers are at plus or minus 0.3 degrees Celsius. Many of them are placed beside each other, and some of them are showing values that are different by more than 0.8 degrees C. I can't find anything that tells me if this is a problem or not. Okay. Well, the simple answer is that your monitoring and mapping sensors, they don't need to have perfectly matching values. Sure, it's nice when they do, but your requirement, your requirement in mapping is to verify the accuracy of the sensors not by comparing them one against the other, but by verifying that they've been calibrated. For the monitoring loggers, there should be a valid annual calibration certificate. And for the mapping sensors, there should be a pre-cal and a post-cal to show that they were calibrated before and after the study. That's your acceptance criteria, the one that matters when it comes to verification of sensor accuracy. It's really easy to think that two calibrated sensors should have almost the same rating. But this is only going to happen in a tightly controlled environment like a calibration lab. What you're probably seeing in your mapping is an uncontrolled comparison that has a large element of measurement uncertainty. There's probably some airflow through the area that's changing things up as well as like a difference in response times and resolution between your two sensors. And that's going to make a true comparison really difficult. This measurement uncertainty can only be quantified under controlled situations by a qualified metrologist, which is what happens when we get into that calibration lab. If your mapping loggers have that accuracy of uh, 0.5 C and your monitoring probe has the uh, accuracy of 0.3 C, it's not impossible or that unlikely that you'll see a 0.8 C difference. And it certainly doesn't mean anything is wrong. If your mapping protocol doesn't include some specific criteria, that these sensors should match perfectly or match within a certain amount, then all you can do really is verify that the sensors are properly calibrated. Here's another question on mapping. I have to periodically remap our temperature controlled rooms. I'm trying to determine whether during temperature requalification, it should be done for 24 or 72 hours. The initial studies were done for 72 hours. And I'm wondering if this needs to be done under static or dynamic conditions. My gut is to lean toward a 24 hour static full chamber study. The reasoning is we've already proven 72 hours of empty chamber and loaded chamber static dynamic conditions. This is just a verification that everything is still in a qualified state. I do not want to overkill a study, but I've searched high and low on the internet and there's a ton about initial qualification in all aspects of qualification validation, but there's not much for performing requalification, revalidation. I've looked at the World Health Organization, the FDA, EU, but I've come up empty. I'm hoping you can help. No, this customer's experience, it matches my own experience and findings. There's a lot of information on mapping and initial qualification, but there's almost nothing, no information on requalification. The best resource I've found for this is from the ISPE, the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers, um, in their good practice guide for mapping of controlled temperature chambers. Sometimes I feel a little embarrassed recommending this guide because I contributed to it, but obviously you won't care because you're listening to me talk right now. Now these ISPE guides, they can be kind of expensive. I think they're around uh, 300 or so. But if you're doing any serious work in temperature mapping, it's really worth getting yourself a copy. Now the ISP guide basically tells us to remap every one to five years. 
That's based on performance history and criticality of the given uh, space that you're mapping. They recommend that you document your approach and use a risk assessment to justify your choice and double check those decisions. And really, this is exactly what this customer suggested they were gonna do, to do a shorter mapping of a full chamber while it's still in use. And this approach is perfectly consistent with the ISBE recommendations in the guide. And this makes sense to me, that if there's been no history of malfunctions or repairs on this unit, and plus it's just easier to map something loaded because you don't have to convince the owner to empty their chamber just for your study. Okay, good. I really like how people are very descriptive in their questions. They give you a lot of information. That's great. So here's a question. Uh, I was wondering if Isla has any papers that address warehouse changes in the midst of fast changing business needs. I'm responsible for mapping warehouses at our company. They keep making changes to the warehouses, which means I have to keep remapping them. And I don't foresee the changes stopping soon. Is there any model to just map the changed area or to not doing seasonal mappings after a change? I really appreciate that this customer is trying to maintain compliance in what's a pretty difficult situation. My experience is that most folks don't take their warehouse mapping seriously enough and do regular remappings, including seasonal mappings. There are a few things we can do to lower our mapping requirements, but it's just the typical risk-based arguments about why mapping part of the warehouse is okay or why a non-extreme uh, uh, seasonal mapping you know, is okay as well. But all these arguments, they can only be used if you already have a good mapping history to draw. You really need to understand the basic temperature dynamics of the warehouse space to make conclusions about how it will behave in other situations. This is how you get to the place where you can confidently say, I don't have to map the whole thing. If you don't have that background, that, that basic understanding, you can't make a statement like that. Now, I think this customer is a perfect test case for a practice I call continuous mapping. This is basically the same as temperature monitoring, but you use the same number of data loggers as you would use for mapping. So you're gonna be monitoring with two, maybe three times more loggers than usual. I knew this sounds expensive at first because you have to buy more loggers and you have to keep them calibrated. But when you do the math, honestly, you save money on every mapping because the mapping is so much easier. You don't have to maintain mapping loggers. You don't have to rent mapping loggers. There's no wasted time deploying loggers in a scissors lift or in a forklift up to the dangerous top of the warehouse stacks way up there, 10 meters up. And all that time savings makes it cost less, especially when we're dealing with a situation like our customer who is having to map her warehouse yearly just to keep up with the pace of changes. With this continuous mapping model, you still need to do the validation part. Right? You still need to go in, select a time period, and officially verify performance by, by looking at the data. But it becomes a lot easier when all you have to do is grab data from a given time period. I'll take a moment to give a plug for my upcoming webinar on exactly this topic of continuous mapping for warehouses. It's later this month, and if you're interested, um, come on down and join us. That's great. Yes, please join us. Uh, June 24th, that's happening. And if you happen to see this video after the 24th, the webinar in its entirety will be up there for you to watch on demand. So just go over to that web page and put in your name and, and join us on the 24th or watch that on demand. So I think those are good questions for today. Let's keep our our video blog brief. Thanks for joining me, Paul, and thanks to everyone who watched. Stay well.